Hello, I'm Alan Hess. I'm an architect and historian, and I've written um, this book on Las Vegas. We Las Vegas came out in 1993. I wrote it because nobody else was writing anything like it. I was really curious about what were the early buildings, casinos, uh, um, hotels, Las Vegas like? Um, who designed them? Why did they look that way? And I could not find much information on that at all. So I did the research and, uh, and uh, uh, eventually wrote this book. Uh, it's been a great basis. I've been thinking about Las Vegas ever since. It has so many different dimensions to it. And a few of those is what I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon. So I'm going to uh, start my slideshow right over here and where the west begins see this is an important part about las vegas so uh, again why i wanted to write the book and share it with other people to provide this information why does las vegas look this way um what were the forces that created it and most important why is it so significant and why have a lot of people never really given it its due credit for being um, uh, for being significant as a piece of architecture, as a piece of city planning? Um, so as we start, here are two examples of Las Vegas architecture: the Aladdin sign from the early 1960s, the Mint sign uh, on Fremont Street. These are two of the best architectural designs in Las Vegas. Why aren't these in the uh, history books? I would much rather see uh, a debate among architects about which one is better. W what are the characteristics of each of these uh, uh, designs? Uh, why is one better than another? Why is one more effective than another? This is the sort of discussion that we just do not see with any architecture in Las Vegas, and it deserves it. We need to have that sort of discussion. These buildings need to be part of the mainstream of architectural discussion. We'll go into the reasons why in just a bit. Uh, these are the sorts of buildings that we do see in the architectural histories, uh, often discussed, often debated. And these are all great architects uh, and great architecture. Uh, there's the Lever House in New York City and Park Avenue by Skidmore Owings Merrill, Ville Savoie by Le Corbusier in France, uh, and of course, Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. All wonderful pieces of architecture, really important things that we can uh, learn a lot of lessons from. But the thing is that by about 1960, architects were becoming bored with modernism as it had been taught and practiced since the 1910s, really. Uh, it had had a 40, 50 year run, but the ideas had played out. And so in architecture, you see uh, some brilliant architects, younger architects, uh, looking for other ways to express the 20th century and its forces. Uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, of course, this is uh, in Columbus, Indiana, uh, a fire station looking for a new way to do architecture, or Louis Kahn's Sock Center in San Diego, um, almost a ruin itself, reaching back into ancient history to create architecture of and for today. So there was this uh, dissatisfaction in the architecture community with uh, the same old modern architecture that had been going on for quite a while. Well, in that context, this is where Las Vegas becomes important. Las Vegas had developed uh, new strategies for architecture, and it was rooted in the 20th century and the way that people were living in the 20th century, no question about it, using new technology like certainly uh, neon, uh, but also rearranging itself shaping itself for the automobile. The automobile being another new piece of 20th century architecture. Las Vegas architects understood this and began to design for it. Um, 
reaching back into the beginnings of the Las Vegas Strip, for example, we find one of these new types of architecture, the motel, becoming the basic building block, the primitive hut, the starting point for a new type of architecture and a new type of city. So for example, the um, El Rancho Vegas on the right-hand side there uh, by Wayne McAllister, uh, the first uh, hotel to be built on what became the Las Vegas Strip uh, as well. On the left-hand side, an aerial view you see in the foreground, uh, the next hotel to be built, uh, the last frontier as well. And as you can see, these are out on the edge of the city. These aren't downtown and they're spread out and they're on the, uh, the highway. They're scaled and they have signage to attract people driving by in the automobile. And then they have pools and landscaping and restaurants and showrooms and uh, of course, many other attractions. Um, so these were motels but in Las Vegas's way, they were glorified motels. They were larger, they had bigger budgets, they were more luxurious. And uh, all of those things were part of Las Vegas's exploration of a new type of architecture for the 20th century. Not one rooted in uh, the Bauhaus and uh, European ideas of modern architecture, uh, going back to factories and a mechanistic look, no. This was a modern architecture which was rooted in America, particularly in the West, and with tourism and the automobile, and uh, you might also say pleasure, pleasure creating these new types of spaces. Well, Las Vegas went on to take that early, smaller roadside motel and expand on it. Here we have an aerial view of uh, on the bottom, the Desert Inn on the top, the last frontier as it, well, as it developed as the frontier in later years. And you see all the basics of this building block of the motel. Uh, it's oriented to the highway. There's a lot of parking, people are arriving by car, but also it has the pool and the motel wings as well, stretched around the landscape areas. So we see how they've taken the architects of Las Vegas have taken these simple ideas from the roadside motel, very functional, very practical, and grown them and changed them and adapted them and made them into this extraordinary type of building, the Las Vegas Hotel Casino. And in something like the Desert Inn, certainly as well, here we see at ground level, uh, the pleasures of, uh, of, of, of staying here, of being here, you're in the sunlight, you're, you have the pool, you have landscaping, you have other people. Uh, so all of these things are creating a new type of architecture, which was, as we all know, extremely popular. Now these, this, this type, uh, this type of tourist industry architecture, um, is also a, uh, a real phenomenon in the 20th century. So the Las Vegas hotels, the Sahara, the Caesars, came along in the 1960s, are not just isolated um, artifacts. They are part of a long history in American modern architecture. At the top here, you see the uh, Marlboro Blenheim Hotel in Atlantic City from the first decade of the 20th century. This was an all concrete building, concrete being a modern building material. And it was an extraordinary piece of architecture by the architect Will Price that created an entirely new type of architecture with its own original 20th century ornament. This wasn't harkening back to anything in Europe or ancient history. This was something new for America and the way Americans were living at that time that tradition continues straight on through to Las Vegas. Another aspect besides the development of the motel that Las Vegas really perfected was the sign, of course. Uh, here we have in the early 1950s, the Desert Inn with this wonderful cloud-like 
uh, sign on top of this brick pylon. It grows out, the sign grows out of the architecture itself, the building itself, and creates this wonderful symbol uh, and artwork which connects you to the desert. And it's a, just a delightful thing to see as the uh, a, a cactus on it. Um, so we're beginning to see here this blending of sign and architecture, architecture and sign. Again, this is something which wasn't necessarily invented in Las Vegas, but it was perfected in Las Vegas. So a few years later, the Stardust Hotel, when it opens, has this enormous sign. And it's plastered on the outside of a concrete tilt-up building, very simple construction. The architecture is the sign. And we see this transition from architecture to sign, sign to architecture. They become one. What, why is that important? Well, because the sign conveys meaning. On one level, just very simple meaning. Where do I turn in? What is the name of this hotel? Where do I enter? Simple things like that. But also beyond that, it conveys a, a meaning about, um, about uh, the, the, the character, the atmosphere that you can be expecting. And certainly something named the Stardust with the entire galaxy arrayed on its front facade. This is something which is, you know, going to be a special, extraordinary place. The Stardust does it. So we have Las Vegas inventing, perfecting, evolving these different strategies towards architecture and city planning as well. Um, on the left, we see a, an aerial view of the Las Vegas Strip in 1962. This is a linear downtown. This is not a traditional downtown. This is not uh, uh, Union Square in the middle of San Francisco, for example, with stores and high rises and hotels around it, centralized. No, this is linear type of city planning. And again, as the motel evolved into something larger and more uh, articulated, so the strip in this later uh, slide on the right hand side, same strip, same format, but it has evolved into a new type of city. These are all things that Las Vegas really should be proud of, should be aware of, should know what its history is and where it came from and why, so that Las Vegas can continue its uh, march into the future. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the people who designed this Las Vegas. And again, I'm being very, I'm skipping over the surface here, uh, just giving you a taste of uh, what riches, what treasures, what information exists in the heritage and architecture, architectural history of Las Vegas. The architecture books worldwide honor among others, these two architects. Uh, on the left, Mies van der Rohe, in front of a model of one of his buildings. On the right, Walter Gropius. Uh, they were both Germans. Uh, they were both involved with the Bauhaus, which was founded in 1919 in Germany. And uh, they were, of course, great architects, very influential. But they're not the only ones that are important. The architects who with such creativity, such innovation, with a finger on the pulse of their times and an understanding of modern materials and architecture created Las Vegas. These are architects that we also should honor in the same way. For example, Wayne McAllister. You see him on the left there with uh, one of his children. Well, he designed the first architect, uh, the first hotel on the strip, uh, El Rancho Vegas. He went on to design at the time, the most elegant and sophisticated hotel, the uh, Sands in the lower, uh, lower left-hand corner in 1962. He also built the Hotel Fremont, which still stands on Fremont Street downtown as well. This is one of the architects who shaped Las Vegas, brought their ideas here. 
Another one is Paul R. Williams. Um, he designed uh, at the top there, the uh, Royal Nevada Hotel in the mid fifties, La Concha Hotel, which thank goodness the, the, the lobby of La Concha of course is, uh, is now the lobby of the Neon Museum in Las Vegas. Paul Williams also designed the uh, Guardian Angel Church also on the strip as well, showing his, uh, the spectrum of his uh, creativity. He could design all these different types of buildings. A third architect who deserves to be honored, who uh, introduced uh, real innovations in Las Vegas is Martin Stern Jr. Uh, he designed in the upper right hand corner, the International Hotel, later the Hilton. He then went on to design the MGM Grand, the first one, now Valley's. He also designed the Mint Tower downtown on Fremont Street. Each of these buildings had innovations in it, which Las Vegas allowed, permitted, encouraged. That was the atmosphere of Las Vegas that allowed this sort of innovation to go on. Uh, to solve these problems of designing architecture for this new type of suburban metropolis. All three of these men were from uh, Los Angeles, actually. They were Los Angeles architects who worked frequently in Las Vegas. Equally important are the sign designers. And these were people who were based in Las Vegas. Uh, we have uh, Kermit Wayne, uh, Brian Lemming, Jack Larson, Ben Mitchum, and they're standing in front of the uh, model of the Aladdin sign. They all worked for the Young Electric Sign Company, Yesco, which was one of the main creators of signs in Las Vegas. And of course, the important thing about these great signs like the Aladdin sign is that they typified the lack of restraint the lack of creative restraint of both the signs and the architecture of Las Vegas. And of course, these uh, buildings and signs had enormous budgets. So these extraordinarily creative men could create just uh, these visions, which were practical. Again, they directed people, showed them what the name of the hotel was, but then they were artistically expressive in conveying some sense of the, uh, the story, the fantasy, the atmosphere, the excitement, the pleasures that the hotel itself would uh, provide once you turned your car in. There are a few other people that really deserve some uh, attention, certainly, as we have come to appreciate over the years, Las Vegas and its architecture. It was, while the mainstream of the architecture profession did tend to ignore it, dismiss it, just think it was a uh, uh, stage set architecture without any real significance. But then two professors from the University of Pennsylvania, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown in the 1960s, uh, realized that there's something else going on here, something important. And with their colleagues, Stephen Eisenhower, uh, they brought a group of students from uh, Yale University to study Las Vegas. This was in 1969. Uh, resulting from that was the book Learning from Las Vegas, uh, just a, a seminal book. And finally, the architecture profession began to realize something important was going on in Las Vegas. Another writer and uh, teacher that deserves credit for setting up the framework of why a place like Las Vegas, out in the desert, built to, uh, to serve uh, tourists, why that would be important. That's J.B. Jackson. You see him at the, the top uh, left, along with uh, some of his students. He taught at Harvard and he taught at uh, Berkeley. Uh, but in his writings, he set out the theoretical framework of why these buildings were important. And it was because they were new and because they served people the way people were living. Las Vegas is extremely important as a piece of American architecture. It does encapsulate, bring together, represent 
a sense of American power. Some of the other icons of 20th century architecture, which also embody the sense of power, include um, uh, the River Rouge plant or Henry Ford, an extraordinary, this is from the, the teens and 20s, the architect was Albert Kahn. And this was an extraordinary complex where literally raw ore was brought in from the Great Lakes on ships from Northern Michigan uh, and docked and uh, offloaded. And at the end of the process, you had a Model T Ford running off the, uh, the, the assembly line. An extraordinary sense of American modernity, power, organization, muscle. Another example of this sort of sense of American power is, of course, well known to Las Vegans, uh, Hoover Dam as well, built in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, an enormous dam which controlled the, uh, the Colorado River and which brought electricity and power and flood control to the entire American West, uh, thus increasing its economic value and success. In the same way, so many symbols in Las Vegas also embody the sense of what is uniquely American about the 20th century, and also symbolizing the sense of power that Las Vegas uh, it does embody. My favorite example is the dune sign, no longer existing, of course. Uh, but it was an extraordinary, multiple stories tall lined in neon. And uh, I remember distinctly standing at the bottom of this one night. And uh, the way it would work was animated so that it would go completely dark. And then there would be ribbons of neon which would be illuminated, starting at the bottom and zipping up, not just zipping, really exploding upward to outline this, uh, this kind of uh, mosque shape. Uh, onion dome shape. And then the D-U-N-E-S uh, letters came on and it flashed and it moved and it roared and it roared. Well, it didn't roar. It was entirely silent. But standing underneath it, as this explosion of light went up, you had a sense of a rocket, the power of a rocket just taking off into the sky, but all silently and done with electricity, with light, with power from Hoover Dam. Part of this, of course, I want to thank the Nevada Preservation Foundation for um, including me in this uh, series of talks. Um, they're doing a great job uh, preservation of these, not at just state, uh, of statewide interest, but of national interest and international interest. And of course, we have lost any number of great buildings. Uh, this was the original Las Vegas Convention Center by architect Adrian Wilson. Uh, the, the convention center is there, but this wonderful dome is not. As I was putting these together, I realized the domes are a typical type in Las Vegas. The Dome of the Sea um, at, the, uh, at the Dunes Hotel as well, a marvelous construction. Um, held up with those uh, wires that you see at the top, suspending, uh, having the, uh, the, the dome suspended from it. It was a restaurant. Uh, or some of you may remember the Cinerama Dome as well, uh, a version of Bucky Fuller's Dymaxion, uh, Dymaxion uh, Dome as well, no longer there. Other things that are no longer there, which make us realize how we need to treasure what we do still have. This is the bar at one of the early hotels with these wonderful murals by Albert Stewart as well. And again, this one just typifies, captures Las Vegas in the 1950s, a cowboy riding a, a bull, and in the background, an atomic bomb blast out in the Yucca Flats in the desert. An extraordinary thing, right in the middle of the casino over the bar. Um, long ago lost. 
Another current thing, which is in Las Vegas on uh, North Las Vegas Boulevard, is Bob's Big Boy. It actually hasn't been a Bob's for many years. It's been a wedding chapel, but it has been bought by uh, new owners who are going to turn it into offices, as I understand. But they're going to keep the building in the sense of adaptive reuse of these historic buildings of Las Vegas is really the way of the future. Uh, you see a rendering of what it originally looked like in a nighttime view. These buildings is an example of Googie architecture, architecture which was meant to attract the eye of the motorist driving down the strip so that they would be able to turn in and have a meal. Uh, perfectly, perfectly suited to Las Vegas. Or this uh, building as well, which I think is uh, something which uh, uh, Las Vegans should really appreciate. This is, of course, McCarran Airport. Uh, this is the original terminal uh, designed by Welton Beckett, a architect from Los Angeles, and engineered by Richard Bradshaw, a brilliant engineer. Now, the important thing about this building, it's hard to see these days. McCarran has just grown, of course, uh, like Topsy. Um, uh, but this is still there. Go and take a look at it next time you're uh, arriving at McCarran. Because this is a thin shell concrete structure. Richard Bradshaw was the preeminent engineer for this daring new type of uh, architecture. It is a thin shell. It's just a couple of inches uh, wide at certain points in it. And it tapers, and of course, and it's very broad so that you don't have uh, uh, columns inside. You have this broad open space. It's a beautiful structure. Now, McCarran, this part of McCarran has never gotten the attention it deserves. Because a few months before this opened in the early 1960s, this building opened at uh, JFK Airport uh, in New York as well. This is the TWA terminal designed by Eero Serena. And it is an extraordinary and great piece of architecture. Recently adaptively restored, it is now a hotel. Uh, but it is not as pure a piece of architecture or engineering. It's a beautiful piece of sculpture, but the engineering which gives it these swoops and soaring lines is not as pure as this terminal here at McCarran Field as well. This is an extraordinary piece of engineering and architecture, beautifully expressed, um, and it is something which uh, Las Vegans should indeed be very proud of. So to wind up, uh, my point has been that the architecture of Las Vegas is significant. It is important. It has innovated in major ways. It deserves its place in the history books, definitely. As much the Stardust deserves its attention as much as the Lever House by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. The Stardust, of course, signed, designed by Kermit Wayne. I showed you a picture of him. Uh, earlier on. Uh, these are important buildings. Las Vegans can indeed be proud of these. What's more, they should be working to preserve what remains of these buildings so that the heritage can be enjoyed by generations in the future and so that architects can be inspired by these daring, innovative designs as we move forward with new architecture in the future. So thank you very much for joining me today. And um, uh, thanks again to the Nevada Preservation Foundation and uh, hope to see you in Las Vegas soon. Bye.